Hello everybody and welcome to Theology 101. In a previous video, we talked about God's providence. Today we are going to talk about how God's providence relates to the problem of evil. The philosopher David Hume summarizes the tension between God's providence and the problem of evil this way. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? If God is all powerful, then why doesn't he stop evil? The theological concept that explains the tension between God's providence and evil is called theodicy. The word literally means the justice of God and refers to the explanation of why a perfectly just God allows evil. Let's look at how the Bible explains the relationship between God and evil. First, we see that there are times when God prevents sin. For example, when Abraham allowed Abimelech to take Sarah as his wife, God intervened by appearing to Abimelech in a dream to stop him from marrying her. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Second, we see at times that God permits sin. The Apostle Paul explains how general revelation reveals certain attributes of God to everybody. However, those who continually refuse to acknowledge God will experience what we call passive judgment. This means that God does not force them to do anything, but that God no longer intervenes with His grace. Look at how many times the phrase, gave them up, appears in this passage. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. In other words, God allows people to continue to sin if they refuse to acknowledge Him. Third, we see at times that God directs sin. God directs evil actions of people to a certain result even though that was never the intention of those people. But even in those cases, those people are still accountable for their actions, even though God can use their sinful actions for His purposes. A clear example of this is the death of Christ. God ordained the crucifixion, but He accomplished His will through the actions of evil men who made their own decisions. Judas chose to betray Jesus. Pilate chose to let the Jewish leaders have their way. The Jewish leaders chose to execute Jesus. All the people involved in Jesus' crucifixion had their own intentions and made their own decisions. Yet the Apostle Peter says that all of this happened according to God's definite plan. So we see that God's relationship with sin is that at times He prevents sin, permits sin, or direct sin. Now I know this does not provide an adequate explanation for why God allows the existence of evil. So let's look at several truths that might help us with this. First, we need to know that the evil that we see in the world today is a result of the fall. Genesis 3 records the fall, which is the event when sin entered into the world because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, sin has affected every part of creation. And since we live in a post-Genesis 3 world, all of creation is waiting for the day when Jesus will return and restore this world back to the way He intended. This is why the Apostle Paul says this, For the creation waits with eager longing, for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. While it is true that there is evil in the world, God did not create this evil. Second, we need to know that life in a broken world is unfair. In Psalm 73, Asaph, who is one of King David's worship leaders, struggled with how unfair life was for him. Asaph remained faithful to God, yet he almost fell. Why? Because of this. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph looked around, and saw how people were disobedient to God, yet it seemed like they were doing better in life than he was. Look at how Asaph describes them. They were fat, which was actually a good thing back then. Life was comfortable for them, and they didn't struggle. They were on top of the food chain, yet they mocked God. Jesus said in the Beatitudes that His disciples will be reviled and persecuted on His account. People who follow God and are faithful to Him will be persecuted. And those who couldn't care less about God might actually succeed in life. Life is not fair living in this world of sin. But there's a third truth we see from scripture. Suffering can be beneficial. Now let me be clear. The Bible is mentioning how suffering can help 
Christians. This does not explain away all the events of violence and suffering we see in the world today. We shouldn't think that God is saying that it is good that evil things happen in the world today, like murder or starvation. But what the Bible does teach is that for Christians, suffering is a soil from where God's fruit can grow in our lives. This is why the Apostle Paul had this perspective about his suffering. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Do you see the chain? When you suffer, you are learning how to endure through trials. When you endure through trials, God is shaping your character to look like Jesus' character. And when your character begins to become more like Jesus's, you will have hope, meaning that you have a confident expectation for something good in the future because you trust that God is in control. The half-brother of Jesus, James, says something very similar. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James sounds a little bit out of touch, doesn't he? We should count it joy when we suffer, but James did not say that you will feel joy when you suffer. He says that we should count it as joy. The word count is a word to analyze something, weigh it out, and then make a decision. What James says that we should weigh out is the result that will come from our suffering. And suffering, according to James, will produce steadfastness or endurance, which in turn will shape our character. So Paul and James are saying the same thing. God can use your suffering for your benefit. He can use it to change you to resemble Jesus and to strengthen your faith in God. Let me ask you, if you never suffered, would you be the person you are today? I know for me, when I suffered with finances, that shaped my character to have compassion for those who also struggle with their finances. When I saw both my sons spend time in the NICU, that shaped my character to have sympathy for those who have sick children. When my father passed away, that shaped my character to have endurance because I had to learn how to continue to trust in God even when I was suffering from depression. We might never get a satisfactory explanation for why God allows evil on this side of eternity. But knowing God's character should help us trust that we will understand why God allowed evil when we see everything from his perspective when we are finally with him in his kingdom. If you want to study more about the Odyssey, I'll leave a link to a recommended book below in the description box. If you missed the last video where I talked about God's providence, I'll leave a link for you to watch. Until next time, see you.